to the August meeting of the Federated Recording Retirement. in progress. Welcome to the August meeting of the Federated Retirement and Healthcare Trust. I'm calling the meeting to order. Uh, let's have a roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings. Here. Here, okay. Trustee Chandra. Here. Trustee Kelleher. Here. Trustee Orr. Here. Trustee Linder. Here. And uh, as mentioned, Trustee Avasti is uh, absent. So we will proceed with the agenda. Um, few ground rules. We are continuing to meet virtually at this meeting and are doing so pursuant to AB 361. As such, all votes will be roll call votes. If you are not speaking, please be on mute to cut background noise. For discussion items, each trustee will have a turn to speak in roll call order more than once if desired. The public will also have an opportunity to speak on each item after trustees. The public will also have an opportunity to speak again uh, at the beginning of the meeting on any item not on the agenda, but that is within the subject jurisdiction of the board. Um, we will take orders of the day uh, uh, now before closed session. Uh, orders of the day, we need to uh, hear item 5D prior to closed session. This is discussion and action to designate the chair of the board to be the board's labor negotiator regarding compensation for the chief executive order and the chair of the investment committee to be the board's labor negotiator regarding compensation for the chief investment officer. Um, and I think I'd also like to take public comment prior to closed session. Uh, are there any other uh, proposed changes to the order of the day? Uh, so hearing none, do I have a motion to for these amended orders of the day? So moved. And that was Trustee Linder. Is there a second? Trustee Keller is second. We, a second from Trustee Keller I heard first. Uh, any discussion, any public comment? We will vote in roll call order. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Uh, Trustee Chandra? Aye. The, who's next to my roll call order here? One second. Uh, Trustee Keller? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we will proceed. Then with the, uh, I believe we do, do not need to wave sunshine. So we will proceed with the orders of the day. I'm sorry, we'll proceed uh, with item five. Uh, what did I just say? 5D? 5D. Yes. So uh, in closed session, we will be discussing the uh, performance review and compensation for the CEO and CIO and the instructions to uh, the labor negotiators. But I believe before we can do that, we logically must appoint the labor negotiators for the CEO and CIO. Um, uh, Council uh, uh, Lederman or Council Chin, do you have anything to add to that description of this item? No, that's perfectly uh, fine, Mr. Chairman, and uh, please. Uh, proceed. It would be by motion and uh, a single motion uh, to provoke uh, designations would be perfectly fine. Okay. If that's, the, if that's the board's desire. Okay. So is there a motion to accept the chair as the negotiator for the CEO and the chair of the investment committee to be the labor negotiator for the CIO? Do I hear such a motion? I put forward such a motion. So we have a motion from Vice Chair Jennings. Is there a second? I'll second that, Trustee Kelleher. Trustee Kelleher is the second. Any uh, discussion by trustees? Any comment from the public? So we will have a roll call vote. Trustee, uh, I'm sorry, Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Uh, Trustee Chandra? Uh, should I abstain? <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> um, I don't think you can abstain. I'm not sure about that. No, you, you do not need to abstain. Okay, well then, then I I certainly want uh, uh, Trustee Chair Horowitz uh, to, to negotiate, so I will say okay. aye. And I will... Again, it's not a split motion here, so to vote yeah. one is to vote both. Uh, as, as long as you have no personal financial interest in the outcome, 
your mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I certainly do not. Okay, well, no. thank you for that affirmation, uh, Trustee Kelleher. And uh, having been on the board for a couple of years now, I can assure you that neither of these trustees have any financial interest. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I also vote aye. Very good. Trustee Orr? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. And I vote aye as well, and I also have no interest. Um, but, or financial interest. <laughs> <laughs> no interest at all. <laughs> uh, a passing interest, as it were. Um, so next, I would like to take uh, if there are any public comments. Um, let me just read the preamble here. Uh, at this time, members of the public may comment on items not included on the agenda, provided that the matter is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Members of the public who wish to provide comment at this time may do so by, quote, raising your hand in the Zoom app, or if joining by telephone, by pressing star nine on your telephone keyboard. When, pressing, uh, when addressing the board, press star six to mute or unmute. Please state your name for the record prior to providing your comments. Speakers will be limited to three minutes. In addition, public comment on items listed on this agenda will be taken at the time the item is addressed. Is there any member of the public that wishes to address the board? And uh, staff, please help me if I'm not seeing any raised hands. All right, then, so hearing none, we will proceed to the next item on the agenda, which is closed session. And staff will be moving us into closed session. This will take a few moments, so please stand by.
the agenda, and there were a few other items I did want to mention uh, during orders of the day, and that is we will take a break. Um, uh, I think we'll take a break now, we'll normally take it at the 10 o'clock hour and then resume, and that there will also be a recess at one o'clock to accommodate the Civic Center TV broadcasting system. And we're asking all board members to please stay on the Zoom after this call, uh, after this meeting ends so that we can have special meetings to accommodate AB 361. So with that, uh, let us take a five minute recess and we'll resume with the consent calendar. the agenda and uh, the next item is the consent calendar and uh, I forget do we need a motion and approval of the consent calendar this trustee Chandra I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar very I'll well second. that's I'll a second second from trustee Linder any discussion or public comment Hearing none, we will have a roll call. Uh, Trustee Jennings. Let's move forward to Trustee Chandra. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Trustee Orr. Perhaps they're not quite back from our recess. Hey, it hasn't been five minutes. I set okay. a timer. <laughs> okay, I did not set a timer. Yeah. Okay. That is very precise of you. Yeah, you got 48 seconds left. <laughs> okay. Well, if I speak slowly. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, Trustee Jennings, how would you vote if it was 40 seconds from now? Uh, what are we voting on? Uh, approval of the calendar. Oh, aye. And Trustee Orr. And Trustee. Aye. Okay, and Trustee Linder. Aye. And I vote aye as well, so the consent calendar is approved. Uh, next item is uh, death and survivorship. We'll have a moment of silence for those members of city staff who have served the city and have passed. Thank you. Uh, next agenda item is uh, investments and an oral update from our CIO, Mr. Polani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, trustees, consultants, staff, members of the public. Um, this will be a short investment section. Uh, next week, next month, we'll have detailed uh, performance reports from Makita for last fiscal year. But I do have some um, estimates to, that I would like to share with you. Um, last fiscal year, uh, the pension plan returned minus 4.4%, and the health care trust uh, returned minus 10%. Mm -hmm. And these are, again, estimates. Um, the good news is that the median pension plan returned minus 7.6%, and that uh, even though all peers have not reported yet, uh, our negative 4.4 is still in the top quartile of our peers. Mm -hmm. And you know, last fiscal year, the, the plan returned 29.2%. And so that's the nature of financial markets. You're gonna have uh, some up years and some down years, but in the long run, uh, the expectation is that risk assets um, will be rewarded. Exposure to risk assets will be rewarded. Now, the, on a three-year basis, again, these are estimates from Nikita, the return was 8.6% uh, ended uh, this past fiscal year. And that put us in the fifth percentile of our peers. So that's uh, fifth from the top. So mm -hmm. those are good numbers. Wow. Um, and, and we are pleased with that. And, and of course, as you know, <clears throat> excuse me, there are still a lot of issues in the market uh, that need to get resolved. Uh, but we we are off to a strong strong start uh, this fiscal year. Uh, we had a strong July in the markets, reasonably strong August, uh, though the last couple of days have been slightly negative. So through August 16, uh, Makita estimates that our pension plan is up 5.42 percent for this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that all but wipes out the deficit of last fiscal year. Of course, these are early days and just sharing the numbers uh, for what it's worth. Uh, and the healthcare trust is up 6.6% uh, failure to date. Hmm. Um, also wanted to share with you that the city actually, uh, as you all know, elected to pre-fund its retirement contribution, which hmm. it did on July 1st. And the pension plan actually received 184.4 million and the healthcare trust received 18.3 million. And we immediately uh, deployed those assets according to the board approved strategic asset allocation, as we always do. Uh, but you know, this year there were some uh, slight changes because of immunized cash flow and the way that that works out. And I'm actually going to invite um, senior investment officer Jay Kwan uh, to expand on that, and he's going to share his screen uh, and and share some numbers. So. Over to Jay for his usual uh, revetting edge of the seat. <laughs> That's going to be a hard, hard expectation to meet there. Let me, um, let me put up the slide. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see the, uh, the numbers in front of you. <clears throat> riveting, riveting. <laughs> so <laughs> as, as uh, Prabhu noted, the city chose to pre-fund this year. And when you combine that uh, on July 1st with the end of quarter and the fiscal year rebalancing we had to do at the end of June, there's a lot of um, a relatively large amount of trading condensed into a, a relatively small uh, window of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of detail on the pre-funding aspect uh, of it. And th those are the, the three columns of numbers you see in front of you there. So mm -hmm. uh, to... Uh, 
proposed uh, detail, uh, the Fed pension received 184, just over 184 million on July 1st. And as you noted, normally we would take that money and spread it out across the asset allocation. So giving each asset class their um, prorated slice of capital, right? And and thereby we we would keep the plan uh, near its strategic asset allocation targets. Um, but as Prabhu noted, it was a little bit more complicated this year because we had an increase in the size of the immunized net cash flow strategy. Uh, and remember, the immunized net cash flow strategy or INCF allocation, that's where the plan sets aside the next five years of net cash outflows. And we take that money and uh, we invest it in a laddered treasury portfolio. So it's a uh, cash flow matched bond portfolio. You can think of it as a, a short duration uh, risk-free portfolio. So we have that pool of money. Um, and then every month we draw from that pool. Uh, so we draw from the INCF uh, to help pay the beneficiaries, right? Um, sorry, hang on. Help pay, uh, help pay the beneficiaries. This allocation, so the INCF allocation amortizes or shrinks uh, and it gets smaller over time as we pay uh, every month uh, the beneficiary payments. You can think of it just theoretically as the plant's piggy bank, right? It, it helps us avoid having to potentially sell assets in, in dislocated markets um, to simply fund the benefit payments. Um, so what happens at the start of the fiscal year is we have to determine how large uh, of a pool, how large of a piggy bank we need to uh, make those uh, payments. And the way we do that is we use the projections provided by Chiron, right? So they give us uh, uh, projected uh, uh, beneficiary payments going out. They project the contributions coming in. And uh, that's where we get this idea of immunizing the plan's net cash outflows. And that's, that's why we call it the immunized net cash flow allocation. Um, so it, it might seem like a long time ago, uh, it probably reminded us though that um, it, the returns for the plan post COVID were very strong, right? 29% and change for fiscal year ending uh, June, 2021. And that was great for the market value of the plan and great for the funded status of the plan, but it had a kind of perverse effect on the net cash flows. Uh, because the outperformance that year basically nets against the uh, prior underperformance of the preceding years and uh, reduces the sponsor's UAL payments. So if you think about it from a cash flow perspective, the net cash flow, right, uh, the beneficiary payments were unchanged. So those, those, uh, those largely didn't change year to year, uh, at least the projections but we had less contributions coming in, right? Uh, so same beneficiary payments going out, less contribution coming in, the net cash flow uh, leaving the plan becomes larger, right? It becomes more negative money coming out. So more cash going out means we need to set aside more of the plan uh, as that piggy bank. And so we had to increase the size of the INCF to 8% of plan. All right, and it's penciled in in the strategic asset allocation at 5% of plan. So to get that extra 3% into the INCF, uh, we could have done a couple of things. We could have taken a bit of capital from every other asset class pro rata and kind of shrunk everything else down just uh, in proportion. Or we could have taken the money from the parts of the plan that were the most similar. Uh, and so we discussed this at the last special IC meeting back in June. And as you can see from the numbers, uh, we ended up doing the latter. So we funded the increase in the INCF by drawing down uh, the IG bonds allocation. So second line of detail from the bottom. Uh, and so the, the three columns are the of, of numbers. The first column, uh, SAA, those are the strategic asset allocation target weights. Uh, you, you as a board approve that every, uh, every March, in March, April. Uh, the, the second column labeled 63022, those are the allocations at the end of the uh, fiscal year. And then post pre-funding, that's uh, what we moved the plan to after we got the sponsor's uh, pre-funding contribution on, on July 1st. And so you can see how uh, 
the immunized net cash flow allocation increased uh, to uh, take into account the, the next year's uh, uh, well, the kind of reloading of that five-year net cash flow projection. And to take that beyond the, the 5%, uh, again, the offset was the IG bonds line. And so just wanted to go into a little bit of detail there um, uh, to keep you apprised of what's going on at, at the plan level in terms of capital allocation. Uh, and, and one note, um, so the IPS or the uh, investment policy statement uh, mandates that we keep the asset classes within plus or minus 10% of their target weight. Uh, and so for the INCF to be at eight relative to the 5% target weight uh, is, is actually technically out of the bounds uh, and mandated by the IPS. There is a line there in the IPS though that uh, says the INCF allocation is exempt from the rebalancing requirement uh, because by design, remember, this is an allocation whose value changes every month. Um, so that, that is, uh, something that we wanted to highlight, but not necessarily ask, uh, uh for an exception. The kind of funny offset though is, well, the, the interesting note is that to fund the INCF beyond its 5% target, we have to take the money out of something else. Uh, in this case, it was IG bonds. And so, um, you know, this is just a note that, uh, the, the offsetting allocation might be out of the bounds of that uh, plus or minus 10% target weight. Uh, and that isn't as explicit as the INCF requirement in the IPS. So many acronyms, apologize for that. Uh, if you want more though, it, I'll be talking about the immunized net cash flow allocation at the upcoming IC meeting. So uh, see you there. Uh, I'll take any questions now if you've, uh, if you've got any. Are there any questions from trustee for uh, Mr. Kwan on the immunized net cash flow calculations? Uh, I just have, uh, what's EMD? So that's emerging market debt. Oh, okay. So, all right, so just trying to understand this uh, because of the post pre funding is at 4.8%. Um, you need to ask because that's, you know, 8% is the strategic allocation, right? And that's certainly more than 10% reduction. Yeah, so the uh, the first column of numbers is SAA. Those are the target weights that are approved by the board. Mm -hmm. And so the, we, we think of those as the policy weights. And the IPS says that we, uh, at the end of every quarter, we need to be within plus or minus 10% of each of those target weights. So for something like, uh, let's say, we'll take the IG bonds line. It has an 8% SAA target. So we need to be, um, you know, 7.2 to 8.6, mm -hmm. uh, 8.8, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of, uh, end of the quarter. Uh, you know, uh, so... It, you can see at the end of June, it was offsetting the immunized net cash flow. The immunized net cash flow at that point had amortized down to just 2.6% of plan. Uh, and the offset there, that, that uh, the difference between the five in the SAA line and the 2.6, that money largely went into the IG bonds allocation. Uh, and, and so the immunized net cash flow is exempted explicitly in the IPS because it's you know, by design, it's something again that changes every month. Uh, right. I wasn't. Uh, I didn't have enough foresight to kind of include the offsetting uh, allocation as well in the IPS when we when we drafted that. And so, kind of the the flip side to having the immunized net cash flow out of bounds is that wherever the money goes or comes from is also out of bounds. Right. And so. So I that mean, doesn't. That goes outside the ten percent. So because IG bonds changed more than 10% because it helped with the IM, INCF, you don't have to ask permission. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear that you can't okay. have one side of the coin without the other. All right, so they go together. That, that's just a, the, a little bit of technical note there. What's the HY bonds, HY? Those are high yield bonds. Oh, high yield, okay. So are you suggesting we should make an edit to the IPS 
so that this is explicitly acknowledged, the offsetting, uh, the possibility of an offsetting violation of the 10% limit? You know, I, I think I would save that one for our next round of IPS edits. Uh, it is this is a uh, this is something that, that that probably could be edited, but I, I don't think it's as quite as urgent as a uh, you know creating a whole new board item. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but we, we've got a bucket where we're, we're capturing all these ideas for for IPS edits, and we'll review them all together at the same time. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a bucket, but I think there's a word doc <laughs> out there somewhere. Maybe a thimble or something. All right. Okay. Any any further questions then? All right. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Sure. And uh, Mr. Polani, did you have any further uh, comments on your uh, action on your agenda item here? No, no further questions, um, comments, Mr. Chairman. I did promise to keep it short. You, you uh, did. And, and I I did have one question. So sure. the. The minus 4.4% for the last fiscal year, I yep. assume that's based on private markets results only through the third quarter of the fiscal year. That's right. And uh, yeah, I mean, and, and these are again, estimates. Um, uh -huh. And, and uh, is that just, for, is that for all private markets or just for private equity? I'll actually let uh, Laura speak to that. I think as we, uh, she is part of this meeting. Uh, I know we are getting numbers in as we speak to true up those, but they should be pretty close to the actual numbers. Uh, Laura, do you have any further color on that? Um, we're still running the um, the audited uh, statement. So um, uh, private equity should be still delayed through just the first quarter. Um, but I think the numbers that uh, the uh, CIO Polani mentioned are, are the most up to date that we have. Okay, well, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to gauge they're likely to move when we get the final numbers. It sounds like they're probably going to be more negative than minus 4.4. Um, I, I think the 630 numbers are going to be the audited ones that are, um, you know, stated on the on the uh, comprehensive annual financial report. Typically, it's the 930 report that then incorporates the June 30th numbers. So when we look at peer relative information as well, that's going to be similar for all of the peer plans that these 630 numbers um, have 331 um, private markets value. So I wouldn't expect that 630 number to change um, on the audited financials, but we'll keep you updated. Okay. All right. Any, any other questions from trustees? Any questions from the public? Okay. We'll move forward to agenda item four, uh, discussion and action on the Federated Disability Committee Charter. Uh, and this was continued from the May 19th meeting. Um, Roberto, are you going to present on this? Um, I don't really have any prepared comments, Mr. Chair. There was a discussion at the meeting in May, which I believe you were absent. And uh, I think the board, um, and anyone can correct me if I'm mistaken, they uh, defer further discussion and action on this item to today's meeting, uh, pending uh, in the review of the draft charter, which is attached for your reference. And, um, and I believe also at the main meeting, there were three trustees that actually uh, were amenable to uh, joining and becoming a member of the committee if that is the uh, eventual action that you board takes this morning. But uh, aside from that, I would just direct you to the proposed charter and uh, you know, as this was discussed to some extent at the last meeting, but um, if there are any further questions or comments, we're happy to uh, try to address them as best as best we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, just just um, to correct the record, I, I was at the May meeting. I was absent at the June meeting. I'm sorry. Yes, you're correct. You're, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and someone was speaking. I couldn't see sure. who that was. Chair Horowitz, if I may, um, I was planning to go through the charter with the uh, board so that they could see the provisions and understand what, okay. if there are any changes that they would like to make prior to making that. Uh, Please proceed. Okay. okay. Let me know if you can see my screen. Mm, not, not yet. yet. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I had to make sure I close out other. Um, okay, there we go. Other ones that, if we other can make that there. larger, that would okay. be great. How about now? Uh, okay, larger still would be better, but. 
Okay, even the that that that's beautiful. Okay, thank you. So as Roberta had mentioned at the May meeting, the the board considered adopt, create the creation of the disability committee and had directed staff and council to start preparing a charter to for its consideration for the creation of a disability committee. The disability the, the disability committee would be a standing committee of the board and it would be assisting the board in carrying out their administrative duties in administering the disability benefits for membership. Um, in around two, just by way of background, in 2017, the city of San Jose adopted ordinance number 29904, which amended the municipal code to ask for a creation of an independent medical panel of three professional medical uh, personnel to help evaluate the disability applications up for the plan, but the board and the city twice tried to solicit for that medical panel and had no success, making it an impossibility to comply with the command under section 3.28.150B, which called for the creation of the independent medical panel of three professional um, medical professionals, excuse me. And so in lieu of the independent medical panel, which has been impossible to meet under the provisions of the San Jose Municipal Code. What we are proposing here is to have the board to continue to evaluate and adjudicate the disability applications of the, for the plan members and to have the creation of the uh, disability committee to help assist in that. Um, so this is the preamble that sets out the historical background for why we are here sitting here today and why we believe that the disability charter is required, not required, is recommended to this um, board. So here, if you look down a little further under the preamble, we do have the committee operations. And as you'll see here, we have decided to propose to the board that the disability committee be consisting of three members elected by the board chair approved by the majority vote of the majority vote of the board and based on the composition of the three member committee at least one member of the disability committee would be from each group one would be from a public appointee group and the other one would be from the plan member group so at any given time the composition of the board would have one of either of those group plus an additional member um, the board shall as it does with all other committees appointed chair by majority vote um, at the, by, by the chair by, and uh, be, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Uh, the board shall appoint the chair by the disability committee and approve by majority vote and that the disability chair would preside just like with all the other committees, there's a vice chair that would sub in and once the, the chair is absent for that, in instances where there's only two members uh, of the disability committee shall uh, require quorum for two members and when that occurs the um, disability committee vote must be by majority vote otherwise it could just be I mean a uh, unanimous vote when there's two members present um, but when there is uh, three members present it's by majority vote any recommendations from the disability must be approved by the board and the disability committee shall meet at least monthly and all disability committee meetings are will be held as all the, all the other committees in accordance with the Brown Act. Um, it will keep minutes as any other public meetings. And here are the uh, committee responsibilities. Um, every, they will review all disability applications. Um, the materials that they will review will be prepared by the department staff, the board certified physician, and any materials provided from the outside uh, retained disability advocate counsel as well as any materials provided by the applicants for consideration and um, once the board has made a decision it will direct staff to prepare for the board a summary of the committee's findings recommendations and conclusions for review and provided if there's any further follow-up the uh, it may be requested by the board the committee would um, follow up on that Furthermore, in addition to reviewing applications, the disability committee will also review the disability application procedures at least every three years and also review and provide a report to um, information from the department staff regarding the disability process and advise the board as appropriate based on the statistical information provided. 
and it will also advise the board at the request of the board regarding any appointment of board certified physicians and advocate, advocate council. And uh, it will also review the chart every three years and submit any changes to the governance committee. Um, and that's essentially the charter in, in sum. If there's any questions from the board, uh, I'm happy to take it. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Council Chin. Um, and, and just to remind all trustees, the formation of this committee as a permanent committee uh, to the board is being considered because we feel there is a huge uh, backlog of disability cases that will be need to be heard. And in the past, we've heard them as a full committee, as a full board, and uh, uh, that may no, no longer be efficient. So with that, are there any questions from trustees on the charter for the new disability committee? I know I have one question, and that is if we can scroll down. Uh, okay. It said the board shall meet monthly. Um, and I wonder if that is necessary. Should it only meet if if needed? The committee. It, so, so it has a clause here as needed. So my understanding when I was working with the staff is that the goal initially is to meet monthly to get through the backlog, but we put in the clause as needed. So if it, there's no need to meet, for example, the month of July, because we don't have any applications to adjudicate, we would not meet monthly. I guess the, the inclusion of the word le at least indicates to me that it will meet monthly, whether it has business or not. And if that's not the intention, maybe we can modify that sentence. Right, we can certainly do that. Are there any other comments, inputs, or questions? Uh, is there any public comment? Would anyone want to formulate a motion to accept this uh, draft and formulate the disability committee? I have some motion. So we have a motion from uh, Vice Chair Jennings. Is there a second? I'll second. That's uh, uh, Trustee Linder. Yeah, and and with, with, you you have, uh, mind. with one, uh, with the, so just for clarification of the motion, um, I, just so I'm clear, with, is the motion to accept the disability charter as written with the exception that subdivision H would be clarified to take out the words at least monthly? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, I just want to clarify for the record. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both trustees. Any any discussion on the motion to accept this draft <clears throat> as amended? Okay, so we will have a roll call vote. Uh, Trustee Jennings? Uh, aye. Uh, Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. And the chair votes aye, so it passes unanimously. And we will take up as a, a future item the appointment of committee members for the Disability Committee. Thank you. But uh, as, as Roberto mentioned, we have volunteers, I understand. So that's Thank you, my tech, for putting that together. Um, Welcome. If the charter was um, adopted, and to become final, I think the next item, Mr. Chair, will be to then at the next meeting, bring a discussion for um, filling up the committee with uh, trustees. So we can actually do that uh, at a future meeting. Yes, that's, uh, that is what I just mentioned. Oh, <laughs> I am, I'm behind you this morning. I, I'll try to catch up, Mr. Chair. Thank okay. you. A cup of Cubana will help. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, so we move to the next agenda item. Which is new business. Oral update up. Oh, yes. Pena, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll try to be quick. Um, I, I want to remind you, uh, remind your board that um, there are two public member trustee seats that are coming up uh, for reappointment uh, on November 30th, 2022. So 
we are working with the city clerk. We have reached out to the specific trustees to find out what next steps should be taken and whether they are considering reapplying for the position or not. But I just want to kind of keep you keep you posted because this has a way of uh, um, really coming up quickly, uh, and we only have about four months to uh, to move ahead. But in any event, if um, the trustees that are currently uh, on board are considering reapp uh, reapplying for another four years, they certainly um, can go ahead with the process and will make it available uh, to get a reapplication uh, in uh, so they can be considered. In addition to that, uh, the city clerk and our office will reach out to the uh, usual uh, options that we have available. Uh, just to see if there are other uh, members of the public uh, willing and able to um, consider joining the board and final application. So I will keep you, we'll keep you posted. So, I also want to let you know that um, the Joint Personnel Committee uh, next meeting has been scheduled. The Joint Personnel Committee actually met uh, in person last week to approve AB 361. So the next meeting is expected to be uh, remote, uh, is scheduled for the morning of September 9th, and is to discuss and receive presentation, hopefully by both compensation consultants on the data that they have to date. Uh, in addition to that, at that meeting, we will then be also approving AB 361 to continue having remote meetings. Um, depending on how the discussion uh, develops, um, we will try to start uh, scheduling meetings on a monthly basis, perhaps for the next uh, couple of months uh, of the JPC as well. Uh, with that, I also want to let you know that the city is encouraging boards and commissions and committees to continue to meet virtually. So uh, we will keep you posted. Certainly we will continue approving AB 361 uh, to the extent that that's possible and available to you board so the virtual meetings uh, can continue. I also want to let you know that the city extended its mandatory masking policy in city facilities at least until August and through August 26. Um, anything new or change to that policy when it comes up, I will make it available. Uh, the quarterly newsletter uh, was distributed to uh, members uh, back in July. Um, I also wanted to uh, give kudos to uh, our staff, uh, our staff from the whole office, including investments, benefits, and accounting, but especially the accounting group and IT and administration as the, uh, the office received the Certificate of Achievement of, for Excellence in Financial Reporting for the 20th or some 21st year in a row uh, for the financial statements for 2021. So uh, a great, great job by staff and especially the, uh, the accounting staff led by their accounting manager, Benji Foy. Uh, so we receive um, the Financial Reporting of Excellence. Uh, in terms of personnel, I uh, wanted to let you know that back in July, we uh, onboard a new accounting clerk, Chris Reyes, he's been working with us. And just recently, we completed the process uh, of uh, interviewing uh, for two new benefit senior analyst positions. They both have accepted, and we uh, expect them to be on board the week of September 5th. And we are currently working on the process of uh, uh, interview process for the senior supervisor position. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, Tara Tran. He, she uh, was actually, she joined us um, as a pension staff specialist early in the year. And she's now being promoted to uh, uh, a health analyst position. Uh, with the departure of Bessie Olano. So congratulations to Tara and, uh, and good luck to you and welcome again. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, Tara has came to us from the pension analyst for the United Nations Pension Program and she has over six years experience with them. Also a great welcome to Jesse Holcomb. Jesse uh, actually uh, worked with us for many years. She actually was working 
when I first joined uh, the office back in 2012, she was an ORS analyst from 2009 to 2014. And she's back uh, with us working as a, uh, an analyst position. So welcome, Giselle. Uh, great to have you back. Um, and just a couple of more things. Uh, we did have our summer picnic back on June 10th. Uh, it was uh, the uh, Willow Glen Park, and it was uh, great to see. Actually, some of the staff that I had not seen in some time, uh, we had a barbecue, and it was a successful uh, um, uh, picnic, even though it was, uh, it was sunny, but very, very warm. I do remember that. Um, as you know, we're still in the hybrid approach, and we, the office is actually open to members from about 9 to 3 o'clock. And we do have a two to three day schedule for staff to come across the office during the week. But I just wanted to let you know, we did have uh, at the building a couple of incidents with strangers wandering around the fifth and sixth floor, hmm. which uh, prompted us not only to call security, but also to close our doors. So we're still open, but the doors are closed. We, we had the doors open before, we now have them closed. We do have a sign at the door. So I just want to mention that not only to keep the board apprised, but also to let the public know that um, certainly they're welcome to come by the office. They just need to knock on the door. We will open them for them. But for the safety of the staff, we have decided uh, for the time being to close the doors. And lastly, uh, obviously, the office will be closed uh, on uh, our service of Labor Day for Monday, September 5th. That concludes my update, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to uh, answer or address any specific questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Pena. Uh, are there any questions, Mr. Kelleher? I thought I saw your... Uh, no, no questions. Okay. Was very any... thorough. Thank you, Roberto. Any other trustees with questions? Any questions from the public? All right, thank you again. And we'll move on to item 5B, which is an update from our city council liaison, uh, council member Davis. Hi, um, happy return from summer to everyone. Is that uh, a holiday? I don't know. Good to see your faces. Well, there was no meeting in July. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. So I just wanted, there's one item that the council took up recently and the, there was discussion about the retirees. So I wanted to make sure to bring it up um, for the employee assistance program. Starting in January, uh, we approved a contract for a new company. We used to have MHN and now we are moving to a company called Concern. It's a strange name, I think. Um, <laughs> and there was discussion about uh, the <laughs> assistance program. So this is for um, basically crisis mental health, and it's going to change from five sessions to eight sessions covered under this program uh, per incident. And then for uh, for police and fire, it will go from unlimited sessions to 20 sessions per incident. And then there's some additional some additional benefit. The, the question that came up from uh, Council Member Foley, who's the liaison to the, the police and fire pension board is whether this would apply to retirees. This is not a benefit that applies to retirees. Um, but one of the things that I, and I know that there's been some discussion about whether or not to extend it, uh, but there seems to be a little bit of con confusion about what mental health services are available to retirees. And so I just want to make sure that this board understands, and, and I don't know, uh, Roberto, how much you're helping the retirees understand that their, their regular health insurance now includes mental health benefits. That's a requirement um, and has been now for, for quite a few years. And so if you have, for example, Kaiser, I'm more familiar with Kaiser. If you have Kaiser, you don't even need to go directly to your primary care physician. You can just call the psychiatry department and talk to them and get a referral. There is some time, um, not just because of Kaiser's, issues which you may have seen about seen in the paper but 
there, yep. there's a shortage nationwide of mental health uh, professionals. And so it does take a little bit of time. There is also, and I want to make sure everyone is aware of this, um, a new Instead of 911, if you are having a mental health crisis or, a, or know someone who is immediately suicidal, instead of calling 911, you want to call 988. That's a new ne nationwide number. It works like 911, but you go directly to mental health professionals. That has been active since July 1st, again, nationwide, including in this county. So those are two... Um, Two items I thought it was important to discuss with the board to make sure the board was aware. The change uh, in the employee assistance program, it doesn't apply to the, the retirees, but they're, it's, it's not the only mental, and frankly, it's not the only mental health benefit that's available. And frankly, it's not the best mental health benefit that's available. The one that's best is the one that goes through your health care your regular health insurance because you aren't limited to a specific number of uh, a spe specific number of visits. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you, council member. Any questions from the board? Or any questions from the public? All right, well, we'll move on to the next agenda item 5C. Uh, update of Chiron's projections based on preliminary investment returns and discussion and action, or at least discussion of funding methods for the pension and OPEB plans with potential options for consideration. So uh, I believe Mr. Hallmark will present on this issue. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let Thank me, you. Uh, share my screen here. So uh, we have uh, two parts to this presentation. The first part, we wanted to provide some updated projections based on the preliminary investment earnings for the year ending June 30th. Uh, these projections are just based on the, the preliminary returns that the CIO just presented and do not reflect any changes in the membership or any of that sort of thing. But we wanted to make sure people had an idea of at least the ballpark range of where we are going to be with projections when we come back with the 2022 valuation results. Uh, the second part of our presentation is, is primarily educational. It came as a result of the actuarial audit uh, there was a recommendation that we do an educational presentation on the, the funding uh, policies and methods for the pension in OPEB, and particularly the question was raised whether uh, the board would want to have the same methods for the OPEB that they have for the, the pension with respect to asset smoothing and amortization in particular. So uh, the presentation is primarily educational so that you understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and, and can, um, can look at that. We, in that process, we also identified a couple potential tweaks. Uh, so we'll get into those at, at the end. And then it is only an action item in case the board wants to make a, a decision at this meeting. Uh, it, we just didn't want to preclude the board's actions. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it to Jackie and Stephen to go through, uh, Jackie first, to go through the updated projections. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, Bill mentioned, this is just a recap kind of, of the last two valuation results and uh, what we're expecting uh, for the 2022 valuation. So. On the, the, in this chart, on the left there, you've got your pension history and on the right is the OPEP history. Uh, and you can see that over the last, uh, from 2020 to 2021, um, that number at the top is your funded status. You can see that has been increasing. Uh, just to backtrack a little bit, the bars on this chart are your liabilities and it's broken out 
the bottom part, the green part of the bar is your market value of assets and the red part is your unfunded liability part. Okay, and then that line uh, joining the, the, uh, the bars, that's your expected market value. So we know from 2022 and 2021 what it was and um, it's matching the top of the green bar in 2022 because that's assuming that you earned your expected return on assets. So just through, uh, this is looking at your market value of assets, not your actuarial value of assets. And this was assuming. Now we look at if we take the actual uh, preliminary returns for the year. So for pension, it was minus 4.4%. For OPEB, it's minus 10%. In both cases, um, obviously it's lower than our expected return for the year. So you can see that your actual market value is lower than what we expected. So what this does is it drops that green bar, that green part of the um, the bars in 2022, and it increases the red part. The liability, the total bar stays the same because we haven't done the valuation yet. So we're assuming you're going to have no uh, demographic gains or losses, uh, but you can see how that affects it. Uh, it drops that, uh, it makes the green part smaller, makes the red part larger. And you can see for both plans, based on a market value, now the funded percentage is expected to decrease from 2021 to 2022. And, and just to reiterate, if anyone has any questions along the way, feel free to interrupt us. Um, you know, this is an educational uh, presentation, so it's important that if anything, if there's anything in here that you're not sure of, uh, don't uh, don't hesitate to ask us. Yeah, I I think I need you to go right back one page. I think I missed the point of the last two. You're saying that the two asset total market value is the same. Could you just restate that one more time? Because I've lost the train there. Sure. So on in the first uh, on slide number two. So if we just go back one. Um, no, this what you're saying. Yeah, 2021 versus 2022. I think you said the market value is the same. However, the uh, unfunded is greater because why? No, sorry. The liabilities for 2022, the liabilities we're assuming uh, right now, we don't have the actual. So our projected liability is staying the same as the previous graph. Oh, okay. uh, but in this graph, the, the change here is the bar, the total bar is staying the same, but you, the green part is uh, decreasing and the red part is increasing. So the total bar is the same as the previous one, but it's just uh, the allocation of the liabilities now, whether they're unfunded or not. That's what's changing in this, in this slide. Okay. Yeah. So the last two slides focused on the market value of assets, but we want to switch to looking at the actuarial value of assets. And what's important about this one is the actuarial value of assets is the asset value that drives your contribution amount uh, for your pension plan. For the OPEP plan, your asset method is to use your market value, so you don't have an actuarial value of assets, but in the pension plan, you do. So what's for the pension plan, you have a five-year smoothing method. So you look at um, your gains and losses over the last five years, and then each, each year, those gains and losses get uh, phased in 20% each year. So this slide shows your gains and losses. So for 2018 through 2020, you had a, you had relatively small investment losses. In 2021, you had a massive investment gain. And then now for 2022, uh, you're going to see a, uh, a large loss, not as, not as large as the, the gain from 2021. So that's a good sign that it can kind of offset each other a bit. This just slide oh, shows how. What was that slide for? I'm sorry. It's so you're just showing us the gains and losses per year, and the point is that we're going to be doing smoothing of these five data points. Yes. Okay. So these are the oh. these are the bases for uh for the smoothing of it. There's yes. it. there's the starting points. So now you can see how we break it out. So as a, so for the 2022 valuation you're going to show how much of each of those last five years is recognized within your actuarial value of assets. So at this point, the 2028 uh, loss will be fully recognized in 2022. 
uh, but that 2022 uh, loss, you're only going to recognize 20% of it. So you can see each year, 20% more gets recognized on, e on each of the buckets. So the 2021 uh, gain, you're now going to be recognizing 40% of that. The 2022, only 20%. Next year, in 2023, you'll have recognized 60% of the 2021 gain and 40% of the 2022 loss. So. And this here just shows how we get from the market value um, to the actuarial value. So this is, uh, this, expe this is expected as of uh, June 30th, 2022, you would have your market value uh, of about a 2.7 billion, okay? Now what you're recognizing is how much of those previous five years of gains and losses have you not recognized? Okay, so we're looking at how much is getting deferred to future years. And of that, you're deferring 290 million of the losses and you're deferring 328 million of the gains. So you've got more gains that you haven't recognized versus the losses. What you do is you, you add those all together and you end up getting your actuarial value of assets, which is gonna be about 2.7 uh, billion, 2.701. Okay, uh, what you can see here is that your actuarial value of assets is going to be less than your market value, and that's simply because you're deferring more of the gains than losses at this point. Obviously, that can change from year to year. So yeah, they're they're really close this year. Last year we were deferring a lot more gains, and so the actuarial value was quite a bit less than that. And this is five year smoothing, right? Yes. This is five year smoothing. Okay. So it goes back to, I think you were saying what, 2018 or? The 2018. So yeah. at this point, you'll have recognized 100% of the 2018. So uh -huh. next year, the 2018 will drop off and you'll recognize 100% of the 2019. Oh, okay. That's your 80, 90, 60, 40, 20. Yeah. Gotcha. So then uh, on the next slide, you can see these are now your bars comparing your market value to your actuarial value, the funded status. So once again, the bars, those are your total liabilities. As you can see on the left and the right, the bars match for 2021 and the 2022 preliminary, okay? And your difference is between these, uh, these two sets is the asset value that you're using from. The left is the market value and on the right is the actuarial value of assets. The right is what your contributions are gonna be based on. Okay, so on a market basis, you're gonna see that your funding status decreases, but because of the smoothing method on the right, your funding status is actually gonna increase a little bit. And that's, um, and that's that's reflecting that smoothing method because you're deferring those gains. So um, th this just shows us so that the funding percentage on the right, that's gonna be the key one because that's, um, that's what's driving your contribution amounts. The 58% for 2222? Yes. Yeah. And in particular, this uh, $2 billion here, yeah. $1.98 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, I'll hand it over to Stephen to look a little bit more into the contributions. Hey, good morning, everyone. On slide eight, so now Jackie just went over the assets and the liabilities. Now uh, we're going to talk about the contribution amounts. This is a, these are the city contribution amounts, and they are based on the actuarial value of assets. So what we're showing here are uh, pension totals. So on the left, we show uh, the contribution amount for the fiscal year ending 2023. Uh, the purple part of the bar is the normal cost. So that is the cost of benefits accruing during the year. And the uh, gold part is the amortization piece. So this is amortization of unfunded actuarial liability. So that is you know, amortization, you know, trying to get the plan funded up. Uh, and that that is dominated by tier one, I should say. Um, so 
the uh, 2021 projection is the line you see connecting the two bars. And hmm. you see that for 2024, uh, there's now, uh, the, the bar is now slightly higher, right? So the, um, the, there, were, there were two things going on. The, the gains that are being amortized in, or the, the gains that are being phased in the assets moving method from 2021 um, offset some of the losses, but uh, from the most recent year, but the most recent year's losses still did increase the contribution slightly from our prior projection. Can you can you tell us how much it would uh, it had increased in terms of the um, contribution amount? So just so we have a final point. So we. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't Hopefully, you that. can read this, but the projection last year was for the 2024 contribution to be 205.1, and it's now 209.9. .9. So it's $4.8 million higher than we projected last year, uh, but $1.1 .1 million higher than the 2023 contribution. Thank you. Correct. And maybe this is understood by everyone, but I, because we are sitting here in August of 2022, <laughs> I want to make sure that people understand the basis for the 23 24. 23 is, is the current fiscal year that the employer is making contributions from July 1st through the upcoming June 30th, 2023. That's the 208.8. And the two on the 24, which is two years from now, is the expected contributions, uh, at least estimated today, would be close to 210 uh, for the fiscal year, July 1st, 23 to June 30th, 2024. I, I'm only saying that because, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to- Now that's important. To understand why we're talking about 24 when we're sitting here in August of 2022. And again, Bill, I just want to confirm, I don't expect these numbers not to vary too much from the actual result once you complete evaluation, correct? I mean, you do have the asset side, but you still need to perform your usual actual evaluations and everything else on the liability side, correct? Right. So uh, we have to produce the valuation on the liability side. We will be coming to the board later this fall to review the economic assumptions. Mm -hmm. And so if we change those economic assumptions, that will change the, the numbers as well. Uh, correct. And, and and we will present the effects at that time. Um, but this is just, if all our liability assumptions are met and everything goes forward as projected, the only difference we're taking into account is those preliminary investment earnings. Understood. I just want to make sure that, I just wanted to make sure that that point was clear on everyone's mind. So thank you. And, yes. and on the liability side, are you assuming a standard growth of liability and waiting for the final numbers? So you're not just assuming flat liability from my- No, not flat liabilities. Okay. We're assuming that the liabilities grow. Uh, they grow with interest, with normal costs for the new benefits accrued. They decrease for the benefits that have been paid out. Um, so that there's a bunch of moving pieces in that. Right. That liability projection, but it assumes that all of our assumptions about our men, yes, that's right, that okay. uh, during the year happen. Yeah, all, all the demographic assumptions and, and the um, other assumptions as well, with just the assets being updated. Right. Um, so there is, so there is a, a small increase in liability baked in at, at yes. this time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bill, could you show tier one versus tier two really quick? I wanted to just make a point that, you know, tier, tier one still dominates, right? So you can see that the amortization payments, uh, the gold there. Um, and then if you compare that to tier two, you know, it's roughly one tenth <laughs> of the size. And the o OPEP contributions are a, a similar level to um, tier two. And then when we show the, the total, you know, it, again, it's dominated by tier one pension.
So I'm going to ask a question. I'm sorry. Sure. On the tier two, um, the difference between tier one and tier two is only a half a percent because we're not talking about benefits here. So, I mean, if you're tier one, you get two and a half percent per year. If you're tier two, you get two percent per year you know, of when you retire. Now, although tier one, you can retire at 55, tier two, you need to re you retire at 62. So is it that age differential? Why is it so different? Because we are, the city is starting to hire a good number of tier two employees now. Is it the number of employees that is in tier two or is it the age differential? Because the 0.5% shouldn't make that big of a difference. If, well, there are several things going on, but if you, if you compare ongoing costs, the, the normal cost mm -hmm. um, is, is not, you know, there it's 16 million uh, for their tier one, what was it, 20-ish? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the ongoing cost isn't all that different. Uh, the, the population is older, uh, um, but the, I mean, the, the big difference is that the, the tier one has all those legacy liabilities, right? So it's, it's much more mature, whereas tier two is a, a newer tier, uh, has very little in terms of um, the UAL, uh, unfunded you know, liability amortizations. Yeah, Judy, another way to say this is that tier two is almost or about 100% funded. So what you're mostly paying for as an employer is the normal cost, but the tier one has a huge unfunded liability. That's why you see the huge difference between the two. Yeah. Does that and make sense? Well, but, yeah, part of it is though, um, the normal costs are fairly close uh, yes. because the there is the difference in the benefit value, mm -hmm. but there's also the difference in the number of, of members covered, active members covered. But as I recall, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but mm -hmm. as I recall, the tier one and tier two, the number of active members is fairly close. What's different is almost all the retirees are tier one. Right. And so all of that liability is in the tier one bucket, and there's nothing comparable to that in the tier two okay. bucket. And, the, and, and even among the, the actives, the tier one people are the people who have a lot of service and the tier two people are the people who have a little service. So the, there's a difference in the liability, even for the actives, just because of the different but don't you, service they have. When you're evaluating the retirement liability, you're, re, you know, it, let's say you have someone who's 24, you know, and just joined the city, you're still assuming that they're going to retire at 62 and their life long, you know, how long they're going to live and blah, blah, blah. And, and so you're still taking that whole stream and trying to put that amount in, right? I mean, so. Yes, but uh, yes. I'm going to defer that because uh, we are going to get to exactly that point in the next part of our presentation to talk about how the funding methods work and, and uh, divide the the liability over an individual's career. Yeah, and, and the retirees, the people that are actually retired now, um, the unfunded liability, um, that's also looking, I mean, most of the impact is investment, right? And so we're looking at that 2008, 2009, that's still um, yeah. on the horizon. I think, I think that'll become especially clear as they go forward. I'm just trying to put my I'd wrap my yeah. brain around right. the big difference between tier one and tier two. I know tier two costs less, but um, you know. right. So we will get to some of it in the presentation here as we go forward. Okay. We'll yeah. get to even more of it as we go through the valuation process, and we will um, okay. show the demo. But foreshadowing, it's and, the and big that. losses back in 2009 that affect tier one and don't affect tier two. I think so. So that's, that's yeah. where you're seeing this big difference. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and this, you know. Additionally, and as interest, interest rates came down over the years, so, you know, those weren't there for, those were, those were impacting tier one, but tier two wasn't around yet. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess the last thing I would notice, we're looking at employer contributions here, right? So there's also a different split as to who pays 
who pays yeah. her. Because tier two is paying 50%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just don't okay, want to throw so, tier one under the bus, you know. I mean, it's so easy to do. <laughs> okay, just saying. Okay, so I think we're moving on to, yeah, so, so now we're showing the projected contributions out into the future, and we're starting here uh, with, with the pension. Uh, similar to before, the, the gold bars, the gold portion of the bar is the unfunded actual liability amortization. Uh, the, the, the amortization layers, you can see this sort of move over time. Uh, and then the purple is the, the normal cost, the cost of benefits accruing each year. And we also have two lines you can see along the top. Uh, the, the upper one in lighter blue representing the, the projections in, in 2020. Um, and the lower one representing the, our projections in, in 2021. So. So, so what's going on there? Well, um, the 2020 projections were before the uh, the asset gains that occurred, right? So the nearly 30% returns uh, for fiscal year ending 2021. Um, so when we had our 2021 projections, you can see the dark blue line, those came down significantly, the, the, um, the employer costs going forward. And so now we're showing results with the 2022 fiscal year end uh, the losses. So you can see the um, the amounts come back up a bit, but they're not as, as bad as they were two years ago. So I guess you say they're um, again they're, they've come up a bit, but not not uh, they don't look as bad as they did a couple of years ago. And we um, yeah we, and when when we add in the OPEB uh, results again, you know, tier one dominates. So the the, um, the graph looks pretty or chart looks pretty similar. Uh, there's there's another 20 million or so in there each year for the open. Uh, so any questions on those projections before we move on? And the basic story is that the great returns uh, of 2021 really lowered the projections. The losses this year have not put us all the way back where we were in 2020, but it's somewhere in between, um, a little more, more than half the way back. Um, so now we wanna uh, talk about the funding methods and really get through uh, how it is that we develop those contribution patterns uh, and how we assess the, the liabilities and, and what the methods are and what the options are uh, with those methods. So again, on this part, um, if there's something you don't understand or have a question, please speak up as we go along. I wanted to start with uh, how we project the benefits. So the basic liability of the pension plan is to pay the benefits in the future that have been promised. And so we start our valuation process by projecting those benefits into the future based on the provisions of the plan, the census data, and the assumptions that we get, that we use. Um, for salary increases, for mortality, retirement rates, et cetera. And, and so those are all uh, projected out in the future. Uh, if we're looking at the tier one pension, uh, it is a, a closed tier with some minor exceptions for uh, new hires who meet the definition of a classic employee. And so this projection is uh, not going to have a whole lot of variability in it. Uh, you know, our assumptions can be off, but uh, e even when we've made significant changes to uh, the assumptions, it it uh, moves these benefit payment projections just uh, mostly slightly, uh, especially given how many of the tier one members are are retired. For Tier two, uh, this, th this projection only includes the tier two members who are uh, 
members as of the valuation date. And we are constantly adding new tier two members. And so th these projections are gonna constantly uh, grow as we add more layers of uh, tier two members on. Uh, they're a little bit more volatile given um, salary increases and, and some things like that that may differ from our assumptions, uh, but still uh, pretty reliable other than that uh, as we move forward, we're going to keep adding on. The OPEB uh, group is also uh, predominantly closed. There is a catastrophic disability benefit that continues, but it's a much, much smaller piece of the liability. Uh, however, as we'll show later, the, the <laughs> projected costs of healthcare are much more volatile than the projected pension payments. And so these benefit payments that we're projecting can move around uh, much more than the, the pension, primarily depending on the, the costs of healthcare uh, going forward. Now, when we do the valuation, the first thing we do is we take those projected benefit payments and then we discount those to the date of the valuation based on our discount rate. Uh, six and five eighths for the pension and 6% for the OPEB. So the, the purple bar, the dark purple represents the discounted benefit payments and the light purple represents the, the interest piece. So that's the portion that's, that's discounted off. And then we end up with this dark purple piece um, that, that is our discounted amounts. We sum those all up. Hey, Bill, can I ask a question? Sure. Can you go back. Uh, can you explain that um, the uh, interest part again? Um, because it's not unfunded liabilities, so right, you know. No, this is just a present value. So if we're looking at the the benefit payments that has to be made in the and this is from our 2021 valuation. So there's a little yeah, it's okay. out there. But uh, so taking, for example, the 2022 payments, uh -huh. for, um, the discounted payments to the 2021 valuation are 231 million. And then we had 8 million in interest discount because we expect the assets, uh, we expect 231 million in assets to earn an investment return of 8 million. And so oh. then there's enough in one year, then there's enough to make the $239 million in benefit. Oh, so that's interest earning. That's interest earning. But you call it interest discount. It, but yeah, it's, it's just kind of going backwards. So, you know, we were looking at, uh, oh, wait, I wanted to do this. But but the light purple, all right, so just I was wrapping my brain around it. So the light purple, okay. So, so that's how that that bar is made up of. Some of it is... Um, right, so, so like this in 2041, there's yeah. 382 million that we're projecting in benefit payments. Okay. There. But if we... Uh, look at it here, mm -hmm. that 2041, 272 million of that doesn't appear in our valuation because it's discounted for future uh, interest earnings. Uh, okay. And, and then, so we're only showing $109 million as the present value of the liability for that year's benefit payments. And that's the... Funding on hand at that time, or the but no, we're not looking at the, yeah. the assets. But what we're saying is, if we had 109 million, uh huh, in 2021, set aside okay the then benefits it, in 2041, we'd have enough when we got there because of the interest earnings. Because of the earnings. okay, I get it. I understand now. Thank you. I I just didn't get it. So yeah, no, that yeah. that's good. All right, uh, and so. We take away that interest discount, and these are the discounted benefit payments, and then we add those all up, and that gives us what's called the present value 
of future benefits. So that's the value on, on the valuation date of all the benefits that we expect to pay out uh, to current members. Doesn't take into account new members. Um, then the actuarial methods step in and we split that amount between an amount we attribute to past service, which we're showing in the dark gray, and the light gray is an amount we're attributing to future service. So, so if someone uh, has 15 years of service, if you're looking at it on an individual basis, we're assigning a liability to those first 15 years that's in this dark gray, and then the future liability for what they may earn going forward is, is in the light gray. And so you can see here for the tier one, that light gray piece is a very small piece. And that's because we have a lot of retirees who have no light gray piece, uh, fewer actives, and the actives are getting closer to retirement. So they have less future service. So that's a, a relatively small piece. When you check to tier two, now they have very few retirees, almost all actives, and their service is much more limited. So the liability uh, for their projected benefits is mostly attributed to future service and not to past service. And so we pay for that uh, in the normal cost each year. We have a, a schedule that will pick up this attribution for future service as we go forward. OPEB is also uh, very little future service, mostly all past service. So uh, then we, we have that broken out. The, the attribution for past service that becomes our actuarial liability for our funding target. And we're gonna compare that to the assets. And then we have a slice of this future service attribution, which becomes our normal costs. And we'll, we'll talk in a little bit more uh, about how that slice gets, gets done. But we develop our contributions based on uh, a couple of components. One is that normal cost piece. How much of the liability are we attributing to the next year of service? So we're, we're paying for that piece. We pay for administrative expenses. And, and often um, we shorthand the description and the normal cost includes administrative expenses. So I just wanted to call it out here. And then we have a payment on the unfunded actuarial liability. So uh, on the charts Stephen was showing, the normal cost and administrative expenses were that small purple bar at the bottom, and then the payment on the unfunded actuarial liability was the, the gold bar. Can I ask one more? You know, the yeah. administrative expenses. I mean, we call that many different ways, you know, different things. So is that the cost of running retirement services? I mean, what is that? Just yeah, it's the cost of administering program. the plan other than the investment expenses. So okay. all, all the expenses are split between administrative and investment. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and we carve off the investment expenses to be a part of the expected return. And the, so it's like Barbara's house, that part. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. That's fine. Roughly. Roughly. Yeah, give or take. All right. Got it. Um, so then. The San Jose Municipal Code uh, defines how these costs are split between members in the city. And, and roughly tier one members pay three elevenths of the normal cost and the administrative expenses and no portion of the unfunded liability. The tier two members pay half of everything 
there there is some um, limit to the volatility of their contributions, but um, but they pay roughly half of everything. And then the OPEB members just pay a flat seven and a half percent, and the city pays whatever's left. Now, for the OPEB, the seven and a half percent currently covers um, the normal cost, the administrative expenses, and a little bit more. And so the city's contribution is all uh, paying down the unfunded liability. Now, when we set up, so we we have to set up a process for assigning the normal cost and for payments on the unfunded liability. And there is not a single answer for each plan. Uh, there's a range. And, and what it boils down to is there are three different objectives that uh, plans normally look at. And, and they compete a little bit. And so the, the first and most important one is benefit security. We wanna make sure that those benefits that are promised are secure and, and can be paid when they are due. But the benefit security comes from a couple different places. Uh, first and foremost, it's the ability and the legal obligation of the plan sponsor to make future contributions. So um, we're very, very fortunate, but we have a thriving city as the sponsor, uh, but also perhaps more importantly, they have a legal obligation to pay the contribution that we come up with. So when you read in the paper about a, a lot of plans across the country that have had um, struggles, a big portion of that often comes from the fact that they don't have that legal obligation. Uh, so the the retirement board and the actuary say, we need this much money contributed this year. And the legislature or the city says, well, well, that's nice. We're going to give you this amount. Uh, and I was at a conference a few years ago where the director for the Illinois Teachers Plan noted that it was the 75th straight year that they had not received the amount that the actuary recommended. So, um, so that's a, a very big piece and, and very important uh, that we have that and, and we should feel fortunate. Uh, the security of the benefits are obviously uh, also dependent or on the amount of money that's in the trust and how that trust is invested because those proceeds from the trust uh, can't be used for other purposes. So it, it provides a security. In general, when we're looking at this, benefit security uh, is enhanced if we have shorter asset smoothing periods and shorter amortization periods because it gets us to that 100% uh, funding faster if we shorten those. So that improves the amount of money in the trust and gets us on, on target with those. But we have an offsetting concern. Uh, we need uh, some level of contribution stability and predictability. I mean, if we were just ignoring all other considerations, we might say, well, we have $2 billion in unfunded liability. Uh, city, we need $2 billion this year. That sort of approach, um, if we could actually get it, would improve our benefit security. Uh, but it could also throw the sponsor into bankruptcy or, or make it very difficult to manage uh, maintaining the plan. And so that's what you see really is it becomes very difficult to manage maintaining the plan. And so then there, the sponsor has to make changes to the plan. And so those significant increases or decreases, just the volatility of the, the contribution can create uh, problems for the stability of the whole system. Uh, 
in, in particular, um, rapid reductions in contributions uh, can end up sort of writing the pension plan out of the budget. And then when you need the money, it's very difficult to get it back into the budget. And so we, we want to be cautious with that. So in the extreme, contribution stability and predictability is enhanced with longer asset smoothing periods and longer amortization periods. And so um, there, there's that inherent conflict between those, those two objectives. The last objective I wanted to mention is generational equity. In the ideal world, each generation of taxpayers would pay for the public employees who provide services to those taxpayers. Uh, and so that would mean that we would accumulate assets in an orderly manner during a member's career so that we had the full amount needed to pay all their retirement benefits at the time they retire. That's what we would strive for, but we always have the challenge where we have fallen short from the past or uh, in excess from the past. And so how do we balance, uh, you know, if you take the case now where we have a $2 billion liability that's based on past service that goes back 20 or 30 years in its origin, um, how do you spread that over the future generations? We can't go back to the prior generation of taxpayers and get the money. And so we have to figure out how, how we balance that. If we do it very over a very short period, we are uh, hitting the current generation of taxpayers harder than if we do it over a long period. But then if we do it over a long period, too long a period, we're kind of kicking the can down the road to future generations. And, and so it is a balancing uh, question for the board uh, to address. Okay, so as, as Bill was discussing, there needs to be a way to assign the costs. And so here on slide 18, we have a summary of the current funding methods for both the pension and the OPEV or medical plan. Um, and uh, I'll start off with the actual <clears throat> cost method, which we'll get to in a minute, but it, it is the, it's called the entry age normal method, a level percent of pay. And we'll, we'll look at that on, the, on, on a future slide. Uh, I would point out a few key differences here. Um, you know, the, the pension plan and the medical plans are, I mean, they're different, uh, different animals. Mm -hmm. And so we do have some of the uh, methods being different. Uh, one in particular is the asset valuation method. So as we discussed earlier, there's five year asset smoothing on the pension side. Uh, that is not there on the OPEP side. Uh, they're the amortization method. So how, how do you, you know, how do you fund up the unfunded portion as Bill was just discussing? Uh, there's a, a layered amortization approach uh, in both cases. And the, the periods themselves, yeah, largely similar. I don't, I don't need to go into all the details there. Um, the way, one, one thing I would note is it's tier two, the gains and losses and assumption changes are over 10 years. So it's it's a much uh, a less mature plan and a shorter period was set up there um, just to, I guess, keep it from, <laughs> from, you know, from building up uh, uh, some un un unfunded. Uh, and then on the, uh, another key difference is the amortization payment increase rate. So, so you have, you, you know, you have an unfunded piece that you're amortizing over a certain number of years and um, on the pension side, those are growing at 2.75% a year with um, the intention of keep, you know, keeping it as a, more of a level percent of payroll. Right? Um, and, and that's important on the pension side because those, those payments are so large. Uh, Can I ask a little more? Um, so what are you trying, the Emerton, so that payment increase rate, is that supposed to be the salary increase is that what is that? 
I don't understand. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, the key here is just that on the pension plan, the payments each year are designed to increase, and on the OPEB plan, they're not. And we'll get into. Oh, is that the three percent cola? No, or it's got true? nothing. It's just our payment plan. It's got nothing to do with the the colas. All right. So you'll explain that rate later. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yes. Um, and then uh, another. Another adjustment you can make to an amortization schedule is to phase it in or out, right? So, so um, have it, you know, have it phase in on the front and phase out on, on the back, uh, which is is essentially smoothing, and that is present on the OPEP side, but not on the pension side, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. And then finally, output smoothing. So, uh, when, once you've, you know, determined your costs using a cost method. Do you apply, do you wrap a cord or, or a minimum or do you, you know, ceiling? Do, what do you do to that at the end of the day? Um, so there are a couple um, things that are done there. Okay, so, so we, we talked about the um, entry age normal method on the, on the prior slide and that, that's what the plans are using. Um, but we want to talk a little bit about other other cost methods. So, so the cost method is how you, you know, as, as Bill was discussing earlier, there, there's a there's a piece for past service and a piece for future service. And, and you know, how are you uh, how are you allocating these pieces? How are you coming up with your normal cost? Um, and in in the private sector, the, the unit credit is is prescribed by law um, for for plans. And so, so we're showing the unit credit, uh, <laughs> the unit credit uh, normal cost rate and actuarial liability here for a, a sample member uh, hired at age 30, retired at age 60. And the unit credit essentially says, okay, what, how did your accrued benefit change in, in a given, or what, what does one more year of service do, right? And you take the present value of that additional year of service. And so when, so when someone's young, you are discounting, right? Retirement out at age 60, this additional benefit they're going to get, you're discounting it all the way back to age 30. And so you end up with a very low normal cost rate early in the career. And especially with a final average pay plan, you know, the, the horsepower of, of that, all the horsepower is in the, in the later years, right? In terms of your accrued benefit, because your, your, your final average earnings over your entire, is leverage on your whole career. Anyway, so, so the unit, credit method ends up having a very steep curve in, in the normal cost as, as somebody gets toward the end of their career. And you can see that as well on the actuarial liability. So you can think of the actuarial liability as sort of the accumulated liability from, from the normal cost that, that come in each year, right? Um, so again, it starts out very low and it ends up you know, really steep. So the um, accrued liability increases really fast late in the career. So that's the unit credit method. That's, that's not the method we're using. So let, let's look at the entry age method. What the entry age method does is, is, is you look at the, the, the year when someone enters the plan here, age 30, um, and, and you set up a, a, an attribution period through retirement, right? So here we're saying 100% retirement at age 60. Um, and then what you do is you you figure out the present, you know, the present value of that benefit and, and allocate it over the career, but, but in a manner that keeps it as 11% of pay. You can do it as a level dollar or there are other ways to do it, but here we're doing it as a level percent of pay. And so that normal cost rate stays, uh, stays level throughout the career. And you can see that, um, so it, it, you end up with a much higher normal cost rate early in someone's career uh, and, a, and a lower rate later in the career. Now, th this is an, on an individual participant, right? So you have a whole population of people at different ages at any given time. But, um, but here, we're, we're focusing on an individual participant to, to show how this, how this works. Um, and then the actuarial liability ends up at the same point, um, but it, it, it's, right, it, there's more costs along the way. Um, it just provides a, a, a more stable, contribution rate um, uh, rather than having that sort of steep curve to it. And so that, so, so this is why most 
most, I don't know, like all, you know, all public plans essentially are using the entry age method, cost method. Okay, so, so now we're going to switch over to asset valuation methods. So we, we talked about the five year smoothing. Um, there, the, I mean, the, the point of asset smoothing is, is to re reduce the volatility and contributions, right? Um, and there are, there are things you can do. You can, you can have longer periods, shorter periods. Uh, usually there is, for, for longer periods, there's often a corridor, uh, a corridor being a certain percent uh, uh, you you want to be within a certain threshold, a certain percentage of your market value, right? So you don't you don't want a method that gets too far away from your market value. Um, so that, that's that's the point of corridors. But corridors also undermine your objective of smoothing, right? So if you if you put a corridor, I mean, if your corridor was one percent, <laughs> you could never be within more than one percent of your market value of assets. All you know, most of your smoothing would go away. But so, so here we're showing on the left asset values. So, so this is the actuarial value of assets, right? Used to determine contributions. And um, that's the yellow bar with five years smoothing, or the, sorry, the yellow line. And the uh, blue line is just the market value. So what we're illustrating here is um, two years of bad returns. So negative 25% followed by negative 10%. And you can see the market value dips and then recovers, uh, and the gold the uh, with the smoothing it st it stays right it stays a little higher in those those uh, for five years and then as those get smoothed in, um, and then eventually uh, you know ends up in a similar place. But on on the right, and then there's some difference there because the contributions flow in a little differently. But um, on the right. You can see the city's contribution rate. So here we're showing the, the again the blue being the market value. So when the um, if if it was just if we're just using market value to determine that actuarial uh, contribution, um, sorry the ADC. If that was just determined using market value, it would really spike, right? Because the assets have dropped. But once you put the smoothing in place, you can see that that, that there's a much less drastic spike there. Um, or just a slow increase, and then it ends up at the same point in the out years. Um, once the smoothing has, has um, you know, once the five years have been met, we're assuming all, all other assumptions are met out in the future, so they, they, they converge. Um, but again, the, the key point of, of smoothing uh, is to have uh, more stable contributions, less volatility. And so um, there's also a few illustrations here of, okay, well, what if you had a shorter um, like three year smoothing um, with no corridor. So that, that gives you more of a spike, right? Um, because there's, there's less smoothing. Uh, it's not as bad as having a market value, but um, you know, less smoothing. Uh, you could put a, okay. And then I guess the other thing would be a, a put a corridor around the five year smoothing, right? So again, that, that sort of undermines the, the point of smoothing your contribution. You can see there's, there's a bit of a spike because uh, the, the, um, there's a 20% corridor. So the actual value wasn't within 20% of market. So it gets set to 20% of market, right? And, then, and that causes a spike in the contribution. Um, and similarly- so This is the method the police and fire plan uses. They, they do have the 20% corridor. Um, but after 2008, nine, a lot of plans that had a 20% corridor got rid of it because uh, it just created a spike in their contributions. Okay. And, then, and then the final illustration we have would be a set. Sorry, years. do you guys mind explaining what a corridor is? I see that it's often applied in the notes up there, but there's no clear explanation of what a corridor is. Um, so so the actual value will, will depart from the from the market value of assets based on your smoothing method. And the corridor is just saying it can't get too far away from the market value, right? So, so in when, when there were large losses in 2008, um, if you had a corridor there, you would, you would end up, say your corridor was 20%, then your actuarial value could not be 
less than 80% of the market value, right? So there's a 20%, 20% above or below the market value. So that's the corridor. Um, so in a year when you have really uh, extreme losses, you end up being at the corridor or, and, you know, vice versa in a year with extreme gains, you would be at the top of the corridor 120%. So it, it, um, it limits the smoothing. Uh, and so the, the tighter that corridor, the less smoothing there is. If the corridor, you know, if it was zero, you would just be at market value. <laughs> but um, you, you can see the, um, the spike there on the purple. Yeah, uh, on the right side, the city contribution rate, that, that's with a corridor. And what, what um, so on the left side, the asset value in the purple, you can see it, the, um, the, the corridor is, is hitting. So the uh, actual value is not allowed to go all the way up to where that yellow bar would be with the, just the regular five years. So, so I would say though, for these purposes, um, we don't need to go in too much detail here because uh, we don't have a corridor and we aren't recommending that we add one and the actuarial audit didn't recommend adding one. Uh, it's just being aware, primarily because police and fire does have a corridor, there's a slight difference between the, the two plans. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the key takeaway is that it, it, it reduces the effect of smoothing. Um, and then the the final uh, option we were or illustration we we're going to show here is a longer period, seven years. Um, and typically with longer periods, you would have a corridor. So there's a forty percent corridor. Um, similar result, a little, a little longer um, smoothing period, so the, the contribution arises a little more slowly. Um, but you know, it, 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 again, there's a balance to be struck between how how um, Quickly or slowly, you want you want things to uh, to be so that to rise. Yeah. the vast majority of public plans use five years. Um, the second most common would be seven years, I think. So, and that five to seven is kind of the sweet spot. Um, we're we're not suggesting any change from the five year. So. I think we can just move on from that. Sure. So the more important uh, piece for you to understand is how we set up the amortizations. So uh, we have our full funding target here, and then there's the actual value of assets and the unfunded liability. And, and I'm really going to just focus on how we do it for the tier one pension because that's the the big piece here. And so we take this unfunded liability, but we don't take it as a block uh, like this. It's actually composed of all these different layers that have different sources. Uh, so each year we look at the gain or loss in a given year the assumption change in a given year, and we uh, track a separate layer for it, and then we set up a payment schedule to pay off that particular piece. And so when we do that, and, and we've shown this to you in the past, you stack up all these payments for all these layers in, in a given year, uh, and that the total of those determines our amortization payment. And so there's a schedule that goes out uh, 25 years for the, those payments. The big piece was we established this in 2009. And so this big blue block is the entire UAL from 2009 uh, being amortized. It was amortized over 30 years from 2009. And so this is the, the last payments in fiscal year ending 2040. Uh, and when that goes away, we will expect to see a significant drop in the contribution rate. And so the, the board's uh, policy really focuses now on how we set up these payment schedules for each layer.
So I wanted to just show you a little bit of the dynamics here and um, so that you get a sense for, for how we balance these things in the amortization methods. Uh, our amortization periods are 20 years for gains and losses and 25 for assumption changes. Uh, and kind of the basic approach in the public sector is to do them as a level percent of payroll. So that like that normal cost that ends up being a level percent of payroll, the payments are a level percent of payroll. Well, on 20 years, uh, this is chart over here is showing the decline in the remaining balance. This is the payment as a dollar amount. And so in this example, we're assuming payroll goes up 3% a year. So the payments uh, increase by 3% a year. The idea is that that should be a level percent of payroll. And so in our contribution rate, that would be a flat uh, amount. Uh, on the OPEB side, we've done the uh, something more akin to your mortgage, where the actual payments are a level dollar amount, which if our payroll projections are correct, should be a declining percent of pay each year. And that actually, it pays off the balance over the same time period, but it reduces it uh, faster early on. Um, one of the issues we look at, and the reason we don't really go beyond 25, is if you look at this remaining balance as a level percent of pay, it, it's kind of flat. We're not really paying off any portion of it uh, for like four or five years. And then it starts to come down. If we go out to like 30, it, uh, it actually increases the remaining balance and, and then starts to come down. And, and so that's called uh, negative amortization, and we try to avoid that uh, as, as much as possible. So the normal recommendations are um, 15 to 20 years for gains and losses, and uh, 15 to 25 years for assumption changes. We've tended to be at the longer end, which provides more stability, but primarily because uh, the size of our unfunded made it difficult to pay for it over a shorter period. We also uh, looked at, uh, well, one of the issues that has come up with some plans is they project uh, a payroll growth and then they don't achieve it. And so if you, if you set up your payments at 3% payroll growth, that's supposed to be a level percent of pay, but if your payroll only grows by 2% or 0%, that ends up being an increasing percentage of pay. So to be conservative, we used, for this plan, we used 2.75. For police and fire, we've brought it down to two and a quarter, uh, which was the inflation assumption. I, I mean, so it's just a, a minor tweak. Uh, and I was actually, um, the idea of tying it to the inflation assumption came from something that uh, S&P Global had put out in their ratings, uh, being concerned that some of these percent of payroll growth numbers were too high. And so they set a marker uh, of you trying to keep those payments down to inflation so that they were real dollars. So, Bill? Uh, yeah. If you're turning it as percent of inflation, I mean, today's world, we're at like eight, nine percent. So, is for it, the current and, year, yes. Yes. And, but the city does not um, recognize the inflation rate as a variable when they. Um, look at their cost of living for employees. It, it's made very clear that that's, I mean, of course, you know, in the back of their mind, they're hearing it, but it's not part of the negotiation. 
Right. So the idea here, though, is is to track more how revenue increases, and and so uh, and based not on actual, but what we're expecting uh, inflation to be in the future. So we would not we're not going to increase our assumption to nine percent. It, it's more what's our long term expectation for inflation that we would be looking at. Currently, we're using two and a quarter, but I would expect that uh, when we review that, we may be looking at increasing that. And I'm just curious what, um, so I assume you're getting that through an actuarial board or, um, you know, what they, an expectation of that. I mean, where are you getting your inflation um, indicator? So uh, we do that every year with, <laughs> our review of the economic assumptions, but we okay. look at um, a, a variety of data points, including sort of what market expectations are, what investment consultants' expectations are, and, and a survey of professional forecasters published by the Federal Reserve. So it, we're looking at all those pieces to develop our, our inflation assumption. Um, we'll be back to you with that later this fall so that you can see what those expectations are. Um, they seem to change on a weekly or monthly basis uh, pretty significantly lately. So we'll, we'll see where they are. Okay. And that would impact the 2.75. Uh, if, if we were to go to something that was tied to the inflation assumption, then yes, that would, that would impact how we did the amortization. But police and fire use the inflation. I thought police I heard and fire that. do use. Uh, they use two and a quarter, and they've they've. It's a separate assumption, but they set it with reference to the inflation assumption. Okay. Now, this is to get at the point that was raised in the actuarial audit about the combination of asset smoothing or, and amortization versus a phase in out amortization. So for the pension plan, we use asset smoothing and a straight amortization. For the OPEB plan, we don't use asset smoothing, but we use a phase in out amortization. And, and this technique was uh, originally developed by Alan Milligan, who was the chief actuary at CalPERS. And he noted that when you're using a five-year, this illustration is five-year asset smoothing with a 15-year amortization. When you do that, you take 20% of the gain or loss in year one, and you amortize it over 15 years. Then the next year, you take the next 20%, and amortize it over 15 years and so on until you've done that for five years. So that initial investment gain or loss uh, in, in this structure is actually getting paid for over 19 years because you're only recognizing 20% of it uh, each year for five years and then amortizing. And so that that's we do this right now on the pension side only with a 20 year amortization. So our total period to pay off an investment gain or loss is 24 years when, when you combine them. Uh, but I think mainly his issue was uh, he did not want to have to explain asset smoothing to over 3000 employers and all the members of the California Assembly. Uh, and all their stakeholders every year. And, and so the asset smoothing was a complex thing to, to explain. And so he pointed out, well, we could just create an amortization schedule that mimics that whole thing. And that's what the phase in out amortization uh, is. Now, the difference is that when we do asset smoothing, we're only smoothing the investment gain and loss piece. When we do the phase in out amortization, 
we are also smoothing the liability gain or loss. And you could also do it on assumption changes. So the question is, did you do you want to do that smoothing on the liability gain or loss as well? Well, there's, let me, there's a difference between pension and OPEB that I want to get at. So this chart is showing um, the investment gain or loss. I've made the numbers positive, whether they are a gain or loss, just so that we can see the magnitude of them. And this is the pension side versus the OPEB side. And, and you can see when we just, the scales are different, but the pattern is very similar um, between pension and OPEB, just looking at the investment returns. Where the difference is, is when we add in the liability gain or loss. There's very little, compared to the investment gain or loss, the liability gain or loss on the pension side is, is really small. And, and this is looking at the average here. So on investment returns, it was 140 million versus 22 million on liabilities. Whereas on the OPEB, the investment returns average 17 million, but the liabilities average 43 million. So, the, and, and that's really because of changes in healthcare costs. Healthcare costs go up and down and, and fluctuate and add a level of volatility to the OPEB liabilities that just isn't there on the pension side. And, and so back in 2017, we said, well, we really need something to help smooth the liability experience as well as the investment experience uh, on the OPEB side. Uh, and we also threw in the assumptions on the OPEB side, because when we change trend assumptions, uh, it really moves the liabilities around as well. Um, so it's not just the discount rate, it, it's the healthcare trends that go off uh, 50 years in the future. And so that's when we switch the OPEB plan to use essentially the equivalent of three year smoothing with a 20 year amortization. Now it's also level dollar, uh, but we're just using um, this amortization method. We don't actually break out layers each year. We just phase in the amortization payment and that's why we just use the market value of assets. We're relying on this to smooth. We're using a shorter smoothing period because the OPEB plan is smaller. And so the idea is we can tolerate a little bit more volatility. Um, but that's the rationale for, for, the, for why we're doing this on OPEB, but not on the pension. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Okay, so it's you're doing it because OPEB is smaller because we, the medical we use, cost is a, uh, a larger component. We use three years because OPEB is smaller, and so we can tolerate more volatility. Whereas on the pension, we're using five, but we use the the phase in out amortization because we want to smooth the volatility of the liability impact of the healthcare uh, cost volatility, as well as the asset volatility. Whereas so on the pension, funny. we're only concerned about the asset volatility. And, and so we're only smoothing the assets. Okay, and you're using market value versus actuarial? Because why is that again? Just that piece. So the maybe you said it, but you know, it's getting better. So we're, we use instead of smoothing the assets using the asset smoothing, we use the phase in out amortization, which does wow. the same thing on the assets, but it also does it to the liabilities. So 
we want to smooth the impact here of the gold and the gray bars on the OPAD. On the pension side, we're only concerned about the gold bars. Gold bars, I see. All right. But the gray bars on the OPEB side are the uh, medical costs. Are the medical are largely driven by the medical the medical costs, and, and they cause much more fluctuation. Okay. And so we wanted a technique to smooth those those impacts. I assume the medical costs are offset also by Medicare as people get to Medicare age. You know, right? Yes. Okay, but because tier one can retire at 50 or or whenever, whenever they had 30 years, and certainly at 55, they can, uh, those medical costs are not offset by Medicare at that age. Plus, if you have your children, that's not Medicare either. Right, but even though the costs are offset by Medicare, the change from year to year in mm -hmm. those costs uh, can still be volatile. Okay. All right. I think I get it a bit more. So there's been a lot of information and a lot of concepts put out. Um, we mostly wanted to get the education component done uh, and, and are happy to take, take questions on it. We think all of the current methods are um, reasonable. They're more than reasonable. We think they're really within the, the sweet spot for uh, both of these plans. And I think that was backed up by the actuarial audit. Um, but there's always tweaks that you could look at uh, to, to make some changes. And so in going through this in detail, we identified a couple things that the board could consider. You should not feel obligated to consider them at all because the current uh, methods are, are just fine. Um, but we do need to at least raise the one that was raised in the actuarial audit, which is, um, you know, we could use the same method for OPEB and pension. And they were suggesting that uh, we could just smooth the assets on the OPEB and not smooth the liabilities. So that, so that was that was one. Um, on the um, pension amortization, there are two pieces that we thought uh, could be looked at. One is uh, our gains and losses are amortized over 20 years. Police and fire is over 15. Those are 15 to 20 is kind of the recommended range. So we're fine with, with both of those. But if there's a desire uh, to move federated to 15, uh, this would be a good time to start a phase-in of that approach because we could tie it to that big 2009 UAL layer that has 17 years remaining. And we could use that to help us march down. And it may uh, actually have the effect of reducing how big of a drop that is uh, in 2040. But the main impact is way in the future. So there's no urgency to do it unless uh, you are wanting to move that 20 year period to 15. And I'll show you that impact in just a second. The second thing we could consider is that 2.75% increase rate. We could tie that to our inflation assumption. I did not put an illustration in here for that. Uh, I think if the board was interested in doing that, we would want to present that when we are setting the inflation assumption so that you can see uh, what it would be. Because uh, if we change our inflation assumption, it would have a different impact. Uh, and on the, the OPEB side, this is just one you could consider that we set an initial UAL in 2017 that does not have a, a phase out to it. So there's a drop off in cost. 
you could add a phase out that uh, I have an illustration for that. Uh, but again, the impact of that is is quite a ways in the future. And so it's not uh, not something the board needs to urgently address. So looking, looking at the idea of migrating from 20 year amortization for gains and losses down to 15, uh, what we did is we, um, we reduced periods to, to match up with this, the end of the 2009 layer. And it, it's interesting because we have some gains that uh, from the 2021 investment returns uh, and expected in the future that may help offset. You can see the impact is negligible or expected to be negligible for the next 10, 12 years and then have a slight impact uh, going forward. So there, there's no, no real urgency to, to do this. Uh, if we do continue to get the, the gains, this, um, this teal blue line is what the revised net uh, contribution would be, and the dark blue is the current. And, and so you see out here, we'd have slightly lower contributions. And then after the 2009 base drops off, we'd have slightly higher. So it, it does reduce the amount of that cliff. Um, but it's not, um, I, I don't know, I don't, I, to me, that change is not what's compelling. What would be compelling is if the board wanted to move from 20 to 15, now's a good time to do it because it would have very little impact uh, on current contributions for quite a while. So going back to slide 29, if we could for the moment, uh, you've, you've outlined things we quote could change, but what is your recommendation? What should we change based on your best um, judgment? So all of these things, all of these options are within really the heart of really good actuarial practice and recommendations. But there's a range within those that is based on uh, what uh, what boards prefer and, and what they think fits their their situation. I think um, some of these changes would be uh, very slight improvements, um, and, and so that's why we're we're raising them. But I'm perfectly comfortable with them as they are. Okay. Well, I've been advised by council that we should probably consider any recommended changes um, only after reviewing a, a more formal memo from Chiron on the pros and cons. But what I'm sensing is you're not actually recommending any changes from our current assumptions or practice. I'm, I'm trying to, to. I'm actually trying to sound the board out to find mm -hmm. what areas they would be interested in, and then we could come back with a presentation focused just on that mm -hmm. change. I see. A um, and recognizing that we're, we're going to look at A versus B, and right. both many A parts. and B are very reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, they have different pros and cons. And so we would just uh, focus on, on those changes. Right. Uh, Council Lederman. Yeah, uh, if I may, for the board, um, maybe I can uh, come at, at the chair's question in a slightly different way. OK. And, 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 and I want to get out of the weeds, Bill, for a minute. Excuse me for calling it the weeds. Uh, <laughs> Where we've been in a lot of granular detail. So let me let me come at it this way. Um, this plan has been chronically and woefully underfunded for a long, long time. Uh, police and fire has gotten to 90% funded. This plan uh, 
remain stubbornly at or under 60% funded, which I think you'll agree by national standards is, is uh, out of bounds uh, for, uh, for a plan where the plan sponsor is legally obligated to make contributions. So to get at this a different way, of all the things that you've shown the board, all the techniques, all the methodologies that you've shown and demonstrated in all these charts and graphs to the board today, is there anything that you would offer to this board that would improve the funding of our members' benefits um, and, and make a real in, impact on, on, the, on the sounder funding of our, our benefits. Um, and, and maybe another way to look at that is how do we keep tier two from becoming what's happened to tier one? Um, it's another good comparison. Tier one, the people who are, are promised those benefits in tier one who are retired or are going to be retiring in the next several years are at significant, in my opinion, at significant jeopardy of our being able to meet the benefit payments. 2009 may have been an aberration, but that was 13 years ago. So what of all these techniques would you recommend to the board, either today or in a subsequent meeting so you get a chance to think about it, that would actually improve our funded status from 60% to 90%? So, what we have established, so first, let me address tier two. We we set, and Stephen pointed this out, we set uh, an amortization period of 10 years for tier two. And, and that's because uh, the volatility of the contribution is very limited in tier two. And so by shortening that amortization period, we keep it closer to 100%, regardless of experience going forward because we're getting, um, we're paying off any UAL over a shorter period. Tier one, if we could reduce everything to 10 years, we'd get to 90% much faster. Uh, the balance is that that would significantly increase the city's contribution. And so we ended up with um, a, a balance on these, these periods uh to try and manage a schedule that was reasonable and affordable uh to get the plan fully funded so shortening those amortization periods would help us but the trade off is uh particularly if we do it on the current UAL is that we are going to increase the contributions potentially significantly. If, if the idea, know. the idea of moving the that we put forward here of moving the UAL from payment from 20 years to 15 years it is to shorten that period for fu any future changes. It doesn't really affect the payment schedule uh, that we have in place now. If the board wants us to address the payment schedule that, that we have now and thinks we can um, increase contributions for the city now, uh, we can certainly look at that and, and it would largely take the form of shortening those amortization periods. Could, could I ask uh, through the chair if you could put slide 17 back up? You would? I'd like I'd like to make a point for the board. There it is. So just so the board understands, the board's primary overriding obligation as fiduciaries of this plan is the blue circle on benefit security. Contribution stability and predictability is a nice technique. It's nice to have. 
it's nice not to have an extreme where you put your plant sponsor into bankruptcy. So let's put the extremes aside. Generational equity is also very nice. We've clearly blown through generational equity with tier one as we never collected enough from the generation and from the city during the lifetime careers of tier one to pay for the benefits that the city promised them. Benefit security is this board's primary job. If we can achieve some predictability and contributions, and if we can achieve generational equity, that's icing on the cake, in my opinion. Those are not funding objectives of the board, either under law or in reality under, under their trust obligations. So I just want to make that point clear. And it seems to me that what we what would benefit this board mostly is for Chiron to come back with methods and techniques that would improve for the first time in several years, actually improve the funded status of our members' benefits, as opposed to continue to move them downfield 20 years hence. Um, and so that's, that's what I would encourage the bill and team to come back to the board if you have actual recommendations to improve the funded status of the plan, 60% constantly and chronically is not an acceptable funding level. And I think we're starting to see some of the impacts of that in what Jay told us earlier today about cash flow issues. So I'm just adding that to the mix of this conversation. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. So I think the what's driving the cash flow issues is a combination of higher retirements and actually uh, the better investment performance from 2021 reduced contributions. And so that uh, results in greater negative cash flow. So was that a wise thing to do or not? In hindsight. And should we learn from that? If we book the investment gains too soon, well, it's he, causing us a negative cash flow, was that a good thing to do? Well, we are booking. And would you recommend that we do it again? It, I think ultimately we are going to have a negative cash flow. That's the whole point of having a, a pre funded pension plan. And we did not, um, you know, we leveled off the contributions, we didn't reduce them. And so it, it was just the projection before was rapidly increasing contributions. And with the 2021 returns, the projections uh, leveled off. On police and fire, they dropped significantly. Um, but here, they largely just leveled off. If you look. I, am, I wonder if one of the changes that we might explore there's a tension between uh, stability and predictability, which is very much desired by the plan sponsor, and um, and taking sufficient risk to increase the funded uh, level of the plan. We've actually improved the funded level last year when we increased our exposure to risk assets. So I'm wondering if we move to a seven-year asset smoothing as opposed to five year, that might give the board and uh, the plan the confidence to take continue to take sufficient level of risk to improve the funded status while also maintaining a degree of stability and predictability for the plan sponsor that might be acceptable. Because I think in the past, uh, I think the plan, the board and the staff have responded to um, comments from the plan sponsor seeking seeking stability. So seven year smoothing versus five year, if that's within the normal range of plans, is that something that will improve our performance and, and help relieve some of the tension between uh, stability and, and risk taking? Well, so now you're talking about a, um 
a more complex analysis where we're looking at if we went to seven year smoothing and increased the risk of our portfolio, how would that look? Well, not necessarily both at the same time, but as a first step, what would seven year smoothing look like? And then the board would have to decide what level of risk they would be comfortable taking uh, with those new numbers. And I'm not asking you to answer this today, but perhaps for the next session, if that would might be amongst your recommendations of a possible strategy, uh, yeah. and, and what the and what what that would look like. So that's exactly the kind of feedback uh, we'd want to hear from the board. Uh, I was not thinking that we would go to seven year smoothing, but that is uh, certainly still within the, the, the sweet spot. And it does um, provide more contribution stability for volatile investment returns. And, and so we can, we can provide that analysis. There's also downsides to it because you react uh, more slowly uh, to to actual changes that are long-term in nature and not just year-to-year -year volatility. Okay. And would that increase the funded status or is that no. going to decrease? Yeah, it's going to decrease it. So well, that's really so, what we're trying to accomplish. So this is where I, uh, I would argue to, if you're mm -hmm. looking at the funded status to focus on the market value, because I really don't like the idea of changing your asset smoothing in order to change your funded status um, because it doesn't really change anything real that's underlying the, the plan. The asset smoothing, whether it's five or seven years, should really be based on what's the impact that has on stabilizing contributions uh, versus reacting to long-term trends in, in where the assets are going. Yeah, I, I, I want, I'm glad Bill said that. And I also was, uh, that was music to my ear. I'd much rather be focused on the investment side of things than on trying to manage the city's uh, contribution stability. And, and I don't think risk is a function of, of the smoothing. Risk is a function of the backstop that we have from our sponsor. Um, if they can backstop us, we can take a lot of risk. If they can't backstop us, we have mm -hmm. to be careful about the amount of risk we take because in any given year, in any given quarter, on any given day, uh, we can experience uh, volatility that presents significant risk to the plan if we increase <laughs> the, 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 our um, budget for growth assets or risk assets, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think... One is more of a, an accounting exercise. The other is much more of a managing uh, actual investment expectations over time and having to deal with a market that can present undue volatility. Well, I'm not advocating that we increase our uh, level of growth assets, but I am observing that we were stuck at 50% funded for many, many years because we had a much lower level of commitment to growth assets. So, well, if, um, so moving to seven year smoothing, we can retain and maintain our, our level of confidence in the market and our level of commitment to growth assets, that would be a, a positive result. Okay, but there's two different things there. So, uh, and this is something Harvey said earlier that I wanted to comment on, but I think it became incidental through the balance of Bill's you know, answer, but you've come back to it. Um, just because the financial, the great financial crisis was 13 years ago, to, to, I mean, the power of compounding, we are feeling the pain of some, quite frankly, disastrous decisions to be in a risk off environment and panicked after the great financial crisis that mm -hmm. took place for a long period of time. So to that mm -hmm. degree, I understand where uh, um, Trustee Harvitz is coming from. We are where we are, um, Council Learman. I would say the long pole in the tent are the decisions that were made by prior trustees and CIOs for at least the first five years after the great financial crisis. And to compound that, Steve made a great point, staying in non-risk or fixed income assets when the, inter when, when the Fed decided this was the time to try to promote risk assets like we've never seen in the history of the country, you know, we, we chose to be in fixed income. 
And so mm. that 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 is why we are in the problem we are today. Long poem, the tent. I'm done with with my soapbox. This question of risk still matters, though, because we have. This is why we hired Varus before. I don't think anyone was on the board uh, other than me when we hired Varus. We need to understand. We should always approach this from what's our risk budget? Is it 11% volatility? Is it 12%? Is it 13%? Once that's fixed, we hire the best CIO possible to, within that risk budget, outperform the benchmarks, which is precisely what we've done. We don't know what risk we can endure because until you know we get all the scenario planning from Veris and, and Makita on all of the sorts of things that can go wrong in any interstitial period. I don't care if it's one year, five years, or 10 years. Um, the more that the city, which they've never told us in all of the joint sessions I've been in, you guys go take X risk because we can go do pension <laughs> obligation bonds. We can go do this. We can help you guys out. Um, we can backstop that. We want you to take the risk so we can bridge the gap on our unfunded status. That conversation's never really taken place in a meaningful way. So we, as an investment committee, have settled on 12% based on input from Chiron and Veris and Makita. Because, again, benefit security is important to us, but we also have to make sure that um, there's some predictability and stability in the plan as well. So, you know, it's a very incomplete conversation, and I, and I don't think that we can solve it from the actuarial side by, by changing, you know, going from five to seven years. I mean, it's a more fundamental conversation than that. Now I'm completely done with my soapbox. <laughs> <clears throat> just just to be clear, I'm not advocating that we increase our our level of risk from the current level, um, but it sounds like you know we might want to consider. Um, Bill is asking for for feedback on what possible changes we could consider, and that might be one. Let, uh, let me, and we can review that more at length when he has done a fuller ana analysis of it. Let me also note, and we, we talk about this when we do the valuation, but um, your 60% funded today is not the same as your 60% funded 10 years ago, uh, because those measures are on completely different assumptions. And part of what we've done is not just reduce the discount rate as interest rates have come down, but we've really strengthened a lot of other assumptions, including mortality and, and, and other things that have increased the costs. And so if you look at the, the history of the impact of our assumption changes, it's always been ratcheting it up. Now, you're not the only public system that's done that, uh, but you've done it much more than uh, I'd say the average, uh, both in terms of reducing the discount rate, but also there were a lot of other assumptions that kind of flew under the radar um, from prior to 2009 that we have uh, strengthened significantly and have had a material impact. Um, so your 60% funded today is, is not the same as it was um, back then, you've made some significant improvements uh, mm -hmm. in we the security a, of the benefits. A discount rate above 8% at that time. So maybe to move the conversation along, I don't know, in response to Council Lederman's request, any other recommendations you might make that would improve the, the stability and the status of the plan. Um, but we, we need to see those recommendations uh, from Chiron for our consideration, perhaps at the next meeting. Okay, so we can um, come with some specifically to look at ways of accelerating uh, the process of getting the plan funded uh, and show you kind of the impact of those uh, on, on contributions for and the city and for members. I would also throw out there, I like the idea of the 15%, okay, um, seems like the right move and it's not painful. Um, it might be interesting to, I mean, we might not choose to do it, but to see what that 10% is or a variation between 10 and 15, you know, I mean, just might be interesting uh, to see that. But. Are there any other comments from trustees? and or the public. 
Mr. Chair, if I yes. may ask a couple of silly questions or comments to Bill. So you're the better. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bill, um, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, a lot of concepts <laughs> have been discussed here uh, this morning. Uh, thank God it's actuarial science, which is so riveting and interesting. <laughs> away um you mentioned five seven years on the smoothing and you mentioned that is in the sort of like the goose spot how do you know how many of our peer systems in california use a seven year smoothing versus five generally speaking like are we talking about half of them 25% of them? I, off the top of my head, I'd say it's between a quarter and a third, but uh, I think we have the data so I could. Um, yeah, so so I was going to say, it. what it, I don't know if the board is interested. If they're not interested, you don't have to do it, but I think it might be helpful, maybe helpful to understand in some of those recommendations, you know, how do we, what our peer Besides across the nation, more our peers in California, where they at, you know, so that we can compare ourselves. And the second one is something that I say all the time. Uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what is going to be the end result and what decisions the board is going to make, but I can't emphasize enough that when Chiron, Chiron presents the potential implications on future contributions and funding, Please, please remember is based on a very basic concept that going forward, all the assumptions are going to be met. We know for a fact that is not the case. So when you make a decision, and let me just say either shortening or extending the amputation period, it could have a substantial impact if the future returns are very different than what was expected, right? And just for, for sake of discussion, they just talk about the first two decades of the 2000. If you have a decade like the first decade, which was uh, the last decade, things will look very different than if you actually have a decade like the decade of 2010, which was uh, very fortunate and an increase in returns. I don't know what the future holds, Neither does Bill or Prabhu or anyone else. But I just want you to keep that in mind because whenever we had that discussion, we assume these um, assumptions are made going forward. And the reality is that if they're not, whatever decision you're making, you know, if you extend the amortization period and, oh, excuse me, if you extend the smoothing and then you have seven wonderful years, that would be great. But then you'll be, accounting for the gains at a low, lower, slower pace than otherwise. On the contrary, if there are really big losses, then you know, you're actually accounting then at a slower pace, which keeps you uh, actuarial funding higher. But I think as Bill alluded, you don't want to get too far away from the reality and extending the smoothing uh, can have that impact. Although I would argue that five to seven years is not much of a difference. So. Anyway, those, those were my points I wanted to make. And again, I leave it up to the board to decide whether it's kind of nice to know where our peers stand on some of those issues so that we can compare ourselves. Although I would argue that we are San Jose and very different than all the other employers and cities and counties across the, uh, the, the, uh, the state. And lastly, I'm going to close by saying this is an issue that I deal with my peers when I meet them at uh, my uh, other administrators and CEOs across the state. Usually we have a difference of opinion on many issues because I have made a career and even the last years in San Jose has been on plans that have a, for the lack of a better word, a challenging funded status, I think as Council Littman alluded, police and fire is a better shape than the federated, but on an actual basis, police and fire, let's call it in the mid to high 70s, and federated, you know, in the high 50s to low 60s, versus my peers across the state, they, you know, they don't understand where I'm coming from sometimes because 
you know, they have been for the longest time in the 80, 90 percent funding ratio. And so that also has an impact as to how you perceive and how you look at things when you have this question. So I, I said enough. And, you know, I think this is a great bill. We look forward to information. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to the board to decide how much data you want or they're looking for to support, you know, what you're bringing back to, to them in the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, Chair Horowitz, just a point of order. I turn into a pumpkin at 12.50, just so I okay. missed a bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, so I'm we, driving so we can, to uh, conclude We can drive a little bit more item. efficiently. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm driving to conclude. So are there any other than comments or directives for uh, from trustees for our actuary? And are there any, any, any other public comments? Bill, do you have what you think you need in order to come back with some recommendations or options for us to consider, um, which are limited to one or two levers as opposed to four or five levers? Uh, yes, I think so. I, I, I think I would recommend that we focus on the tier one pension since that's the giant piece. Agree. We'll leave the, the OPEB in tier two alone. Uh, so that we can just focus in on that, and we'll we'll come back with uh, a couple options and the impacts, and we can show you the, the differences in projections and and some volatility around those projections. Okay, I think that's wise. Uh, again, any any other trustee comments? Okay, so we're going to uh, no action at this point. Moving forward to the next agenda item. which is this is AB 361. Um, so with the year back of materials, the city council has renewed its resolution on social distancing. So with that, if this board uh, find, makes the two f following factual findings, which are one that the governor's proclamation due to, for the state of emergency continues to be in place due to COVID-19 and two, that the San Jose city council continues to recommend social distancing in city facilities. This board may continue to meet virtually for the next 30 days under AB 361. Thank you. Okay, so we have heard the factual findings from uh, Council Chin. Do we have a motion to accept those findings and continue to meet under the guidelines of AB 361? So motioned. We have a motion from Trustee Kelleher. Do we have a second? I'll second. That's a second from Trustee Linder. Any discussion from trustees? Any public comment? Hearing none, we will have a roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. Uh, Trustee Linder? Aye. And I vote aye. So it, it passes unanimously. Uh, we move on to agenda item six, committee reports. Um, uh, Investment Committee Chair Chandra. Uh, it looks yeah, like our last meeting was simply a special meeting for AB 361. Correct. And we will be doing that at the conclusion of this meeting as well. And then we will be meeting this coming week, I believe, on Tuesday. Um, uh, but no, no immediate update. I think the CIO gave us a, a, a good update earlier uh, today. And um, just to, to make sure that we receive and file the most recent last three minutes of the most recent last three meetings. Great, thank you. And I, I believe we don't need a motion and a vote. No, no, just a receiving call. Great. Uh, governance committee, I believe that's uh, Vice Chair Jennings. Uh, yes, no um, outstanding issue. Okay, but also special meetings. The audit committee, um, Trustee Kelleher. Uh, uh, also, um, no, nothing really special to report. Uh, so we've got a, um, our last meeting was the um, July 22 special meeting. Mm -hmm. And we have a meeting this afternoon. Perfect. And the uh, joint personnel committee, last meeting um, uh, was also a special meeting. I, uh, I assume uh, trustee or there's nothing uh, special to report. Right. And I believe we have an, another meeting scheduled. Uh, it says TBD, but we actually have one, a date scheduled. I forget exactly what it is. 
um, I believe it's in September. Um, item seven, uh, there is the Cortex report for your review as well as a, a special call out for the NCPERS accredited fiduciary program. If people are interested in Nashville, Tennessee. Are there any proposed agenda items? And hearing none, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And now we will go through. Thank you.